But uh, yeah, so today I'm going to share some of the, the work that we've, uh, we've recently started doing on uh, using deep neural networks to try and uh, uh, analyze and interpret uh, Zane spectra, especially for more complicated systems. Um, so just to begin with, as a, as a way of motivation, I think the first motivation is, is probably familiar to most people that are here in the fact that we have an X-ray absorption spectrum. We can divide this uh, into two regions. We have the near edge regions so of the Zanes and then the extended region, the XFs. And for a long time, um, you know, thanks to a lot of work coming out of the University of Washington, the, uh, the XFs region has, has, has been um, as close to a solved problem as, uh, as, as you can get. Um, even for complicated systems, running simulations and, um, and analyzing the data, uh, is, uh, can be achieved in a relatively quick computational time. Um, however, as we get to the near edge region, the, the more complicated physics involved in the shape and the position of the spectra uh, means that, uh, uh, that actually extracting the structural details is particularly challenging. And so as we see now with, with um, kind of the improvement of things like synchrotrons, uh, it's now possible to get very high resolution data um, on, on you know, operating catalysts, operating batteries, um, and being able to interpret that and, and, and in many ways account for the disorder and the complexity of these systems is, what we're, is one aspect that we're particularly interested in. I suppose the, the, the other kind of area that, uh, that really kind of started my interest in this is more coming from the background of time resolved um, x-ray spectroscopy and so so here as an example we actually have so this is um, some uh, a transient so this is your excited state spectrum so this is pump probe spectroscopy uh, so you have a, a laser pulse that initiates some reaction in this case of a, a, a transition metal complex a copper transition metal complex and then by changing the delay between your uh, uh, optical pump and your X-ray probe pulse, you can follow the excited state dynamics and, and so I got a kind of structural dynamics. And, th and this is, in terms of using X-rays, this is one of the, the, the primary um, motivations because if you, you can do uh, relatively straightforwardly now, um, optical pump probe and um, optical pump IR probe spectroscopies, um, but neither of them directly give you structure. And so if you actually want to follow the structural dynamics and actually um, extract that kind of three, three dimensional structure evolving through time, then something like time resolved X-ray absorption spectroscopy is, is, uh, is very appealing. Um, and so um, on, on the left here, we have uh, um, a, a transient spectrum. So actually this black line is, uh, is an experiment of uh, 100 picoseconds after um, excitation of this copper transition metal complex, where in fact it's relaxed into some long-lived triplet state. Um, so at a third generation synchrotron, these, these experiments can be almost described as quasi-static in the sense that you start in your ground state, you, you pump your system to the excited state, it relaxes into some long-lived um, um, transient state, and then you probe this with a resolution, a synchrotron of about 100 picosecond. Um, at the bottom here, uh, what we became interested in is actually simulating time resolved experiments at uh, um, X-ray free electron lasers. So in this case, the temporal resolution goes down to five to 10 femtoseconds. And so you're no longer in this kind of quasi static regime where you have some starting point and some long lived relaxed uh, transient species, but instead you really have to follow this dynamics. So this, this figure is actually the transient XF spectrum during the first 500 uh, femtoseconds um, extracted from quantum dynamic simulations. So what we do is we set up a model, we run a calculation to solve the time dependent Schroeder equation, um, and then at every time step what we have to do is we have to um, sample that wave function at every time step, calculate our XF spectrum, um, and then turn it into this 
um, what's equivalent to the experimental observable. And this is where the challenge starts because to actually um, get something that's converged, uh, that accurately reproduces uh, or, or could accurately reproduce the experiment, um, at each time step, we're looking at 100, 200, you know, maybe even 500 calculations. And so even if you have one calculation that just takes five minutes, now five minutes is nothing for a calculation. But if you have to do this 500 times, then very quickly it becomes very computationally expensive. And so what we wanted to do was to try and actually speed up this process and so that um, uh, we can uh, we can analyze or predict uh, time resolved X-ray spectrosco uh, um, spectroscopy uh, uh, pattern more um, easily. And so this is where we kind of started getting interested in using kind of machine learning and, and, and kind of data driven approaches. Um, I will actually, uh, so I will point out that actually this, this idea of this direct model from structure to spectrum is, is by no means a new one. Um, and, um, and this has been in, in many ways done for a reasonably long time. The uh, Gregory Smolensev and co-workers uh, developed the FITIT program. And this is in some ways um, the kind of starting point of, of, of what we're, we're doing. You essentially take a particular molecule and, uh, and you, you express its spectrum as a, um, as a, a multi-dimensional interpolation. Um, by running some calculations, uh, you can find your fitting parameters that connect all these spectra, and then you can predict spectra of a particular system that is, is not uh, within the initial set of calculations. Um, I believe you've also had a talk from, uh, from Anatoly Frank Frankel, and um, especially on, on nanoparticle systems, um, there's a lot of very nice work on, on using machine learning to, to extract um, structural properties and, and details um, of these, uh, these nanoparticles, which themselves are, uh, are very complicated systems. And so in, in, in this work, what our, what our kind of motivation was coming, I suppose, primarily from the time resolved direction, but with the, with the knowledge that it could impact other areas, um, is to build on these previous works, but develop a general approach in which we could map a structure to a spectrum. So rather than going from a spectrum to a structure, um, because we're interested in, in, in more disordered systems, um, or then this could be time resolved or, or disordered as in many defects, we're, we're, in, the, we're in the interest, uh, we're interested in the area where defining one structure from a spectrum may not be very physical, me physically meaningful. So what we want to do is we want to go from our structure, and it may be many structures that we end up having, to simulating our, our spectrum. And we're going to try and, well, when I, what I mean by, when I say general, is if, if we have a model developed for the iron K edge, we want this to be able to predict the INK edge Zeng spectrum for any species containing iron. Um, so rather than being um, um, uh, uh, specific to a particular system and being able to distort geometries, we want it to be able to be general. And this is very lofty ambitions and you know, we're by no means there, but I, I, I hope to show you that we've, we've, we've made certainly some progress in the di this direction. Um, so in terms of the deep neural network, what, what actually is in the deep neural network? What is the deep neural network itself? Um, so the idea of neural networks is based upon essentially the um, uh, neur neurons within the brain having uh, many connectivities that take some input and uh, return some output. And so um, when I'm feeling slightly less generous, I, um, I tend to call it fancy fitting, uh, which let's be honest, it, um, it, it largely is. And, and actually it's important to be aware of that, um, to know the limitations of our model when, when uh, going forward. Um, the, 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 the word deep in this case, all that we're actually saying is that we have some um, input structure that we're, we're inputting. And then we, this is our input layer. 
and then we have a number of hidden layers. And if we have more than one hidden layer, then uh, this is what we define as deep. Okay? So keep your alert, one, uh, more than one hidden layer, and then we get our, uh, our predicted spectra. We compare this to our, our spectra that we've, we've fed in um, as, our, as our starting point, um, as our, or as our training set. From that, we can calculate our mean squared error. And then we essentially back propagate it doing something like a gradient descent, because at each point, we essentially, at each neuron, we're feet, we have weights and we have a so called activation function. So, this uh, throughout, we're using an arctan or hyperbolic tangent function. Um, and that then we have a, what's called a dense network. So, each neuron in one layer connects to each neuron on the other la layer. And, and then by back propagating uh, using gradient descent, we can actually optimize these weights and just like any kind of self-consistent field cycle we optimize until we, we we minimize the error and then that um, is our model so when i say we're doing you know it's it's fancy fit fitting just to, to give an idea um our deep neural network usually optimizes about three million uh weights So this is a general schematic of, of what our, our, our network is, uh, is doing. The other thing that we actually do, um, and just to, to caution, especially against overfitting, is we have, we have this, this route through our network, and especially if the training set, i.e. The, the, the structures and the spectra that we feed it, are, um, is, uh, is not complete or is insufficient, what can happen is that your network will optimize the weights of each of these new, uh, nodes to actually find one particular route through the network. In this case, what, um, what we actually do use to kind of guard against this is using dropout. So during each optimization procedure, we drop out about 30% of these neurons to stop the network actually relying on any one particular route through the network. So just to, to give an example, so this is, um, uh, we have here, so what we take is we, we so-called featureize or we use as an input our, the local environment. So we take, we take the structure around the absorbing ion atom. Generally, we take about eight angstroms uh, of radius around the absorbing atom. This can be either put in as a Coulomb matrix or a radial distribution function, which I'm going to show a bit more later on. Um, Okay, we have these four hidden layers. Um, as feeding in, as the training set feed in, uh, we, we used um, uh, Zane's calculations within the Muffington approximation. So um, at this stage, uh, we were really looking to see how the network performed and whether this was feasible at all. And so doing very um, higher level calculations that took a lot of time, then to find out that the network didn't work, uh, we thought it was not a particularly good route. Um, so we use Muffington approximation zone simulations as implemented within the FDM and ES code. And our training set generally is harvested from the materials project um, uh, website, and we have um, greater than 9,000 simulated spectra. Now, oh, the other thing I should mention is that we train on the unconvoluted spectra. Right? So if I spend a bit of time on that, so when we, we run the calculation, we calculate the, cross, the kind of pure cross-section. And then these spectra are convoluted with, um, with, with, with the core hole lifetime, but then also this uh, uh, arc tangent function to account for things like the inelastic losses. And this is a phenomenological approach, but it works pretty well. The reason that we train on the unconvoluted spectra is that we want something that's, that's general. So and this is actually the same reason that we, we train on simulated spectra rather than experimental data. Because we, we, want, we want to be able to train something that uh, then if, you, if you've done your, your spectrum with a certain resolution, if you then go away and do a Hurst spectrum, so a very high resolution experiment, um, that the approach is still valid. So 
we felt at this stage it gives us the maximum flexibility. Um, on the on the left here, the the uh, the upper curve is the the, the the learning curve, where we have our mean squared error, which I appreciate without actually showing spectra at this stage is uh, is is rather meaningless. But the mean squared error as the number of spectra. So here we have uh, just under eight thousand uh, uh, spectra. This is for the I and K edge. And you can see, although it's not completely converged after just after 7,000, the mean squared error is, is falling off a lot uh, slower. Even after about 3,000 spectra, we're more or less uh, pretty close to um, the smallest mean squared error, um, which itself is, is quite nice because uh, it shows that we don't need um, too many spectra to start getting something that's relatively converged and meaningful. On the bottom here, we have um, um, the essentially the mean squared error or a histogram of the mean squared error over all of the spectra in our data set. The inset is, uh, is for those spectra that are unconvoluted. And the, the, the main figure here is the spectra that have, that have they been convoluted. So we've trained the spectra, uh, we've trained the, 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 the network, we've then calculated the spectrum, convoluted them, done a mean squared error, and we've got a mean squared error. Most of them, okay, we've got some that are going to higher um, mean squared error, but they're around kind of certainly less than one times 10 to the minus two. You can see with the unconvoluted spectra, the, the error is about an order of magnitude larger. Okay? So this kind of gives you, well, an idea of the effect of the convolution and, and, and in some ways how it's uh, um, the the resolution of x-ray spectra is, is kind of helping us in this case and, and I suspect why there's not so much work on, on fitting IR spectra with, uh, with, with deep neural networks. Um, so this, this, to give you an idea of, uh, of, of actually spectra, how this works, so again this is all simulated spectra at this stage. Um, on, the, on the top here we have a comparison for three samples taken at random from the top one percent of the mean squared error. So if we take the if we take um, the mean squared error of every spectrum and we put them in rank order, we take at random three from the top one percent, then then these are the three three examples that we see and the difference between the simulated spectrum and then the predicted using the machine learning model is is indistinguishable. So the model is 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 very well uh, predicting these spectra and in the bottom here these are taken from the 99th percentile so these are the the worst one percent and okay you can see that there are certainly differences that are appeal that are appearing appearing the one thing that's that's quite nice uh, with maybe with the exception of this first one on the left hand side is that that this is largely an intensity thing um, the peaks and their positions are, are all in the, uh, in, in the right position, or maybe with the exception of this peak. Um, and so even the worst uh, spectra are doing okay. Um, but this is with, uh, with examples from, uh, from the um, uh, comparing essentially theory to theory. And, uh, and so, what we wanted to do was to try and um, apply this to, to something uh, completely different. And uh, having spent postdoc in Marja Chergi's group in Lausanne, I'm kind of obliged to, if I think of iron, to do iron trist by pyridine. Um, and so um, on the, um, oh, where's other? Oh, sorry. Um, here we have what we did is just a simple structure refinement using this model. So the, the, gray solid line here. So the top two panels are, um, are iron trist bipyridine. So this is iron with three bipyridine ligands. Uh, so the inset is shown here. The hydrogens are emitted for clarity. Um, and on the bottom two panels here, we're doing the same, but for myoglobin NO. So this is a heme where you have a histidine bonded to, this is the iron in the middle with a porphyrin. You have a histidine bonded to the iron, and then you have this NO ligand. 
And so in both cases, we have um, six, six nitrogens coordinated to the iron. In the case of iron trispiridine, it's symmetric. And in the case of uh, the myoglobin molecule, the bond distances are, um, are, all, dis are all slightly different. Um, the, the solid uh, gray line is the, um, um, the experiment. The, um, um, the dashed gray line is the, the theory from the, from, uh, the optimized structure. Uh, from, uh, from what's been predicted from previous optimized structures and our, our black line is our optimized using uh, this, uh, this uh, machine learning model, this, this deep neural network. Um, and okay, you can see differences and certainly for iron trist you can, uh, you can see differences, especially um, uh, with this transition here, which uh, um, uh, this kind of first really post edge uh, resonance I suppose what's, what's nice is that if we actually calculate the mean squared error as a function of this iron nitrogen bond distance, which we're trying to optimize, we get an optimal value of, of about 1.95 angstroms, which is in good agreement with previous um, optimizations and, um, um, uh, and X-ray diffraction. So we've, you know, we've certainly not got perfect agreement between the model and the experiment or the model and the theory, um, but we're getting a good structural interpretation. Um, with, my, with nitrosol um, myoglobin, so MBNO, um, the model actually is slightly closer to the experiment. Uh, the iron nitrogen bond distances in the, in the porphyrin ring and with the histidine um, are, are pretty close to the experiment. The histidine, iron histidine distance is slightly larger um, than, um, um, the experiment. The um, iron nitrogen for the NO ligand is, uh, is about 0.15 angstroms larger than from previous fits. Um, and so th this is, this is, uh, this is the, the, the error that we're seeing there, which is something that we, we've looked to, to improve. Um, but as a structural refinement, as a first kind of tool, um, especially for things that are admittedly a long way out of the training set that we've used, um, uh, we were relatively happy with this as a, as a first fit. So this, this kind of leads me to break slide one. I hope that's a good time. So, uh, all, all good. There's many questions. It's a great start. If you can go back to the figure that has the, uh, the six comparisons between is either theory and experiment or neural network theory and theory. Uh, this, is, this is theory That's and neural slide. network. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, on the bottom, it looks like you have um, a problem with the amplitude of your arc tan function. Um, uh, I realize you're training on the data on the simulation without the arc tan. But, yeah. for example, figure F, if I multiply the black curve by uh, 1.25, then the agreement is much better and the MSE is much smaller. Um, yeah, and, and it's, so for figure F and for figure E, that's the case. Um, it's less so for figure D. Um, yeah. So my, my question is, how do you deal with this overall normalization in absolute units um, when you're trying to compare the two? Uh, okay, so, so we, we, um, um, it, when we calculate um, in the training set, um, so we, we have uh, our, our training spectrum are calculated. We have a range of about 70 electron volts and, um, and the, the spectra at the highest energy. So um, at the edge of the spectrum, uh, they are, are normalized. We normalize everything to one. Sorry, but that's, that's w w without the atomic background or, or is that the um, uh, just going so that's the calculator. So yeah, that, yeah, that's without the that's without the background. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. We'll we'll, we'll keep going. Um, um, let's see. We've got a few more questions. Uh, Samantha, you had a question about MSE. Hi. Yeah, I had a question. Why you chose MSE as your error function versus another similarity measure like cosine or Pearson's correlation? Um. Well, so so um, we did do some uh, we did do some Pearson analysis um, 
after it just joined the join the neural network uh, during the training this seemed um, uh, the the mo well to me it seemed like the most logical uh, way of actually assessing the 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 difference between the two spectra um, um, I'm sure there are other kind of error analysis that we could do and I'm not sure what at this stage the effect that this may have on on the actual network we could still look into that but um, uh, yeah, at the moment, this it felt like the most natural way of com kind of comparing how well the network was performing during the training. Okay. okay. There's also a, a more general background question. Um, the question is along the lines of you have 3 million nodes in your neural network. And so how many data points do you need in order to uh, train it? There's concerns about linear independence and whether uh, you should the not be worried yeah. about it. Um, yeah, so... It, uh, as soon as it's something that still kind of um, uh, 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 bothers me slightly, <laughs> I must admit, um, this, this kind of question about overfitting. Um, and so I mentioned the, the, the dropout and why we, um, and to make sure that the, we're not relying on certain paths through the, the network. Um, the other thing that we, we do to kind of guard against overfitting is, so if we have, um, uh, if we have eight, say 8,000 spectra, then we split these up into groups. Um, and uh, so, so 7,000 of them, we would be, we would, would be in our training set. And then 1,000 would be in our testing set. Um, and then we, we divide and then, and then um, in an iterative process, then we would change this. So um, um, one of the different, a different set of a thousand would be in the, uh, the the testing set, and then the rest of the seven thousand would be in the training set. And we can monitor the mean squared error for the difference between the 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 predicted and the calculated in the training set, but also the predicted spectra. And what tends to happen is if you if you're overfitting, also what uh, happens is that you're the spectra that you that were in your training set, they continue to go down. The mean squared error continues to be to be reduced, while while the predicted spectra ideas that are outside your training set start to deviate and go and go up. So that the predictions get worse, um, and so that that's something um, is also used to guard against overfitting. But yeah, have it, having those two alone still don't entirely satisfy me and it does something that that, that worries me about the kind of overfitting all right two more questions and um uh, i'll ask the questioners to be brief uh das Pemraju, you had a question hi um so my question is um so you're directly predicting the spectra so i suppose you're representing your output of the neural network on some sort of energy grid um yep so how many points do you use on your output energy grid and how does the number of points you use um, relate to either the depth or the width of your neural network? Um, oh, okay. So the, um, uh, the, uh, the number, so we, we take, um, so we have an energy range of about 70 electron volts and this, a stepping of, of 0.25 electron volts. So that's uh, 280 uh, 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 points. Um, so the um, in terms of the the depth and the, it doesn't uh, it doesn't affect the depth. Uh, the width of the the network is actually um, more strongly controlled by the size of the um, um, of the input structure that we're putting. In. So the uh, whether we um, whether we're putting it in as, as, uh, as, as how we represent the structure, whether it's a Coulomb matrix or a, a radial distribution function, which I'll kind of come on to in the next uh, section. I see. So you have, you have more, uh, the size of your input is larger than your output? Is that, or do you have to use some uh, deconvolution or convolution? So, because you, you'd not use any convolution layers anywhere, right? So, um, so is, it, is, is the size of your overall input larger than your output vector or is it? Uh, um, no, the input ve the input vector is uh, is is larger than the output vector. So we the um, each each layer the 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 width of the network is is reduced by thirty percent. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. 
Florian, um, if you can uh, paraphrase your question briefly. Yes, so uh, ma main question is uh, about the noise level. So how robust is your machine against noise? If you look at, um, at non-perfect samples, and we know that some, sometimes the zanes of, of two compounds is extremely similar, like uh, magnetite and uh, macamite is, is a famous example, right? So, um, and you said you want to dis differentiate all iron compounds. Uh, so did you, did you check the influence of noise on your, on your machine? Um, so um, when, you say, when you say noise, you mean um, uh, predicting with experimental noise or noise in the actual yes. simulation? Okay, um, um, so uh, at this stage, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be um, uh, too optimistic um, because we're still in the early days. Um, late, um, we actually, uh, later on in the talk, I'm going to show an example where we, um, of something we've done with cobalt to give you kind of an idea um, uh, kind of, 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 of what we can, uh, what potentially we can predict, but it, it's still, um, yeah, the, the, what we, what the aims I said at the beginning are still, um, um, are the, are the objectives, but I, I, you know, I'd be free to admit we're still quite, <laughs> yeah, <aware>. yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. But <clears throat> so, so are you, are you planning to maybe just a quick follow up to, to include the noise analysis on that? So basically that you then can predict uh, to what oh yeah yeah no, can... we can yeah yeah we we can we can we can have we can have a um, a, um an uncertainty on our uh, on our um on our predicted spectra and the experimental noise will go into that um uh well uh, no not the experimental noise no we we would have well some uncertainty on our prediction and then the experiment will be the compared to the experiment with the experimental noise right okay Ex Excellent. Um, you should continue, Thomas, and thank you everyone for your questions. You should keep putting them into the chat and we'll get to them at the next break. Okay, so um, after, after having um, first set up this, this network, uh, one of the things we wanted to, uh, to test, so this is a relatively short section before the next break, um, the role of the structural representation or the role of, of how we actually input the structure. Um, and so there are there are two ways so far that we've we've actually uh, uh, investigated this. So uh, um, the so-called Coulomb matrix, in which we take our, our structure, and uh, uh, we 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 define a matrix where with I and J with all the different atoms and their connectivity, um, and the on diagonal elements are just the the nuclear mass uh, to the power two point four. And the off diagonal elements are, uh, are the, the multiplications of the nuclear mass divided by uh, one over the distance, uh, divided by the distance between them. Um, this has been used uh, quite commonly in, uh, in, in other, especially in, uh, um, in, in kind of trying to predict chemical properties uh, using machine learning. Um, the, the other way is essentially representing the structure as a radial distribution. Um, so we have some some radio uh, some function which is uh, depends on on distance obviously, and then uh, the, we have the, the 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 nuclear number of the two atoms, and then the exponential of the 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 distance between them minus the the point in the radio distribution curve we are. This alpha is is essentially a a smoothing function. Um, so depends, uh, it, it depends how much resolution we want in this radio distribution function. Um, and um, uh, this is something that is, is optimized and then kept fixed um, during the, uh, <coughs> the, the neural network. And so uh, what we wanted to do was, uh, was to, just to really assess what the, the effect of the structural representation was. Um, so on the left here we have um, this uh, this learning curve. So uh, this uh, the number of sample spectra and the mean squared errors. The the red curve um, is the for the radial distribution curve, and the the me, uh, the grey curve with the the the, um, the black dot circles is the Coulomb matrix. So. What you can actually see from this is uh, is the the radio distribution curve actually performs uh, uh, reasonably uh, uh, better, uh, and uh, um, especially it seems to have a, a kind of 
a, a much faster uh, um, uh, drop, certainly for low numbers of, of, of spectra. Um, on the right hand side here, we have uh, the, the number of passes through the network. So this is the number of, of um, optimization cycles to optimize the weights. And in this case, we basically see no real difference. They both, they, they both optimize after, or well, they're both fully optimized after about 500 passes through the network. Um, one of the advantages of this is actually um, uh, running, actually training this um, is, uh, takes less than, than 20 minutes. So once you have your training set, to actually optimize the weights and develop the model um, is, is, is about 20 minutes. Um, so, so this would appear to suggest that if you, as a, as a structural representation input, you would want to use the, the radar distribution curve. Um, again, just to, uh, so this is, this is actually highlighting um, um, the effects. So this is a, a scatter plot of, um, in the first case, uh, this is the esti um, uh, estimated versus the, the, the actual peak, peak positions. So use it, um, finding all the peaks in our X-ray absorption spectra, um, uh, we've gone through and found essentially where they are actually in energy and then where the machine learning model predicted them. And this gray dashed line is, is obviously perfect prediction. Um, and, and, and so on the left-hand side here, we have the Coulomb matrix. And on the right-hand side here, we have this radio distribution curve. So uh, you can see, okay, ever so slightly, that the, the radio distribution curve is, uh, is slightly narrower, as you'd expect from, um, from having a smaller mean squared error. Um, and on the bottom here, we have the intensity. So the intensity um, uh, that we're targeting versus the intensity that we get. This is with the Coulomb matrix, and then this is, uh, the red is with the radio distribution curve. And again, you can see that with the radio distribution curve, it is, um, um, slightly tighter, which is indicating that we have um, um, uh, better agreement, uh, which you'd expect from a smaller mean squared error. To actually show this from a, um, um, uh, a spectral point of view, um, we have a, a similar, uh, ooh, okay, um, a similar um, um, plot here as we had for the, the first case for iron, uh, which uh, in this case, it's just one sample spectrum I'm showing. Uh, uh, the top two are from the top 1% um, of the fit and the left hand side is using the Coulomb matrix and the right hand side is using the radio distribution curve. The dashed line in both cases is this um, uh, raw cross section, so uh, not unconvoluted and then the solid lines in both cases are the convoluted. And you can actually see here that um, it kind of gives you an indication of, of the, 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 the importance of, of the, uh, well, the, how important relative changes of the mean squared error are, because actually you can see here that although the mean squared error between the Coulomb matrix and the radio distribution curve may not seem like a huge amount, uh, especially if we look from, you know, a starting point, there is actually a, a quite a significant improvement, especially, uh, uh, for the, the radio distribution curve. So again, we get this um, uh, close agreement. Um, on, the, uh, on the bottom panels, this is again, one example, the left-hand side is uh, with the Coulomb matrix and the right-hand side is with the radio distribution curve. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, we, we, you, know, you, can, you can really start to see deviations in the unconvoluted spectra. Um, and uh, some of these kind of so problems or sins are, are hidden uh, in the convolution, but um, it still doesn't account for the fact that uh, um, the, uh, the the model agreement is not uh, is not perfect. So this so this kind of highlights, uh, in some ways, what the importance of of how we represent our structures um, putting into our network is. Um, and um, there's certainly other um, uh, ways of representing structures that, that we, can, uh, we can start to, uh, to investigate. Uh, Thomas, sorry, I don't usually interrupt. Um, what's the difference between the red and black in each of these figures? 
Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, the, so the, the black is the calculated and the red is the predicted from the machine learning model. Okay, and then with and with and without convolution. With and without the convolution, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. And this is um, uh, uh, some iron oxide or another or an iron rich molecule? Um, yeah, so, um, oh, I, I must admit, I can't remember what the structures are, but they're, they're, um, uh, they're, they're two of them from the training set. Okay, all right, thank you. Keep going, I apologize. Uh, so this actually brings me to break two. It seems it's a relatively short second section, but it, um, in, in the next section we change it slightly, so uh, it seems like an appropriate point. Um. Okay, very good. Um, if you can go back to the mu estimated versus mu target. Uh, this one, yeah. Uh, no, uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, uh, so this, these comparisons for mu estimated versus mu target, the, the, the next slide. This one. Um, uh, oh, uh, without uh, sorry, the arc one. tangent, is that correct? Yes, that's without the arc tangent? Yeah, so the dash line, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the scatter plot one. Me, um, oh, the scatter plot one. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's with the arc tangent. Sorry. That's with the arc tangent. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. All right, very good. Actually, um, yeah, we, uh, we did. Um, I don't think we even plotted without the arc tangent. Which now, now, now you ask it, it seems like a stupid thing to do. But uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Matthew Marcus had a question. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, no, no relevant to at least this slide. You know, where does valence come in? Because after all, uh, there's a shift between iron two and iron three. And yet, I don't see any place where valence is really represented. Does it come in uh, sort of implicitly through the RDC? Um, uh, so it, it it comes. It it doesn't really come in at the moment. Uh, we're not including it, uh, which is um, is a weakness of the model at the moment. Um, and yet, it seems somehow to work. Well, so um, yeah, it. it uh, well, so, so we have, um, when we run the, the, the FDM and S calculations, we have a self-consistent potential. So in some ways it comes in slightly through that, but um, it's not, um, um, uh, well, yeah, I, I, I've got on my conclusion side that for me, this is, this is one of the big weaknesses that we really need to address now. And, um, you know, right, someone so asked about- that's your, that's your quote experimental calculation, mainly the thing you're testing against. In, in, is FDM and ES, which includes valence, but the neural network doesn't. So uh, I was, uh, no, okay. So from that says no, no, yeah. The the, the neural the, the neural network is doesn't include valence. Uh, so how is it that you get a decent alignment of the experimental spectra with the you know uh, with the neural network? Well, um, calculate well, the neural network. Um, so I. That's a that's a good. I suspect actually a lot of that comes through the structure because if you have a change in valence, then you you you're you're usually um, having a change in um, um, in. Um, uh, so I guess it's things like stoichiometry implicit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is something that we're actively now looking at. I I I I, I don't think we deal with this really very well at all. And this is, if we want to take this from a computational um, curiosity that's a bit fun to do to something that's actually useful for the people doing experiments, then this is something that we have to solve. Yeah, because I'm assuming that you don't do any fudging of alignment. No, 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 no. Okay. All right. I'll just add that the iron hexacyanides might be an interesting case study for exactly this question. And um, uh, oh, that's we, actually one the ones we the one of the first ones uh, that we put in to 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 look start looking at this properly because excellent yeah. okay and we should um, uh, we should move on then uh, to your uh, your last part of your talk okay okay so in the last part of the talk um, we, we change edges um, and um, um, this is uh, you know trying to get a bit more to well. Um, in some ways starting to address um, complex systems and combine it also with um, with time resolved which is what I um, which is what I was kind of most interested in um, and um, so we 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 kind of came came across uh, this paper it's uh, it's from my old boss it's from Maja Chergi's group um, in, in in which they're doing uh, t-jump spectroscopy um, 
And so the idea of this is uh, in the um, in the time resolved kind of community, we use optical pump pro, um, pump pulses routinely. Um, but most chemistry is not like activated. Most chemistry is actually activated using thermal energy. Um, and you know, while we can argue that maybe you get similar pathways, um, that argument it can somewhat be it can somewhat um, be a little tenuous. And so the idea of uh, of T jump spectroscopy is that instead of using an optical pump pump pulse, you uh, you use um, uh, a near IR uh, laser, and you 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 pro you pump uh, some of the vibrational modes. In your in your molecule, it could be the actual molecule itself, or it could be the solvent, and you essentially heat it up as quickly as you can, and uh, and then you by increasing the temperature of your sample, you can access different minima um, 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 along the way, and uh, and 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 then follow the chemical reaction like that, and or the chemical e equilibrium. And so the 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 interest is is that, is that Again, using using X-rays, uh, so T-jump spectroscopy is very widely used. It's actually more widely used in biology to kind of um, uh, get temperature uh, conformational changes of proteins. <coughs> um, and um, <coughs> so, uh, what what Majed and his uh, his group did was was look at this um, uh, cobalt um, um, uh, in solution uh, where uh, certainly at, at 300 Kelvin or at low temperature, it's predominantly or almost exclusively uh, this hexa aqua uh, complex. And as you heat it up, you can access different minima where you either substitute one um, of the water with the chlorine, substitute two, and eventually you switch from a, an octahedral to a tetrahedral. And um, and so we uh, uh, we we wanted to uh, to have a look to see you know. How well can we 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 perform um, in this? And and the, the kind of the complexity from this comes in from the sense that um, this is this will be even the hexa aqua, even though the the cobalt itself um, binds to the six water molecules fairly stably. Those six water molecules have a long residence time attached to that cobalt. Uh, there's still there's still a lot more flexibility than a, than a I say a, a normal bond, uh, and so there's this disorder there. And then, as soon as you heat the sample, um, by definition, you're creating more disorder. Uh, and so, what we wanted to do from this is to uh, run molecular dynamics, um, um, extract the structures from molecular dynamics at various temperatures for various structures, um, and and then run those using the neural network. So taking the molecular dynamics and calculating X-ray spectra um, has been done many times before. But if you have to calculate 100, 200 spectra for, uh, just shown here, five different species, then already you have a lot of spectra that you need to calculate. And so, uh, um, and so can you do this uh, using the, the, um, the machine learning? Um, so, the, the network itself for COBOL was set up exactly the same way as we did for iron. Um, uh, in this case, the materials project database had uh, just over 15,000 um, structures. And, and when we, uh, when we uh, extracted those, we could actually get a mean squared error um, of two times 10 to the minus three, which is, uh, which is lower than it was for, for iron. So this is a good starting point. Um, this bottom bit's been cut off, but the question is: is how well can we actually ca actually capture um, the, uh, the the changes in the ex the, the experiment? Um, so here we have um, uh, two examples. So on the on the left hand side, um, the the red line is the experimental spectrum. Uh, which they recorded uh, in. Uh, oh, that's embarrassing! I missed off the um, off the citation. But um, yeah, the experimental spectrum they recorded prior, to, um, and this is of the uh, uh, the hexa aqua cobalt complex. So the red line is the experiment, and the black line is the calculated or the predicted using the machine learning model. And this is predicted 
uh, using, uh, well, we, this is from 1,000 snapshots from molecular dynamic simulations. Um, there's, there's a relatively big difference here, which is kind of the most striking deviation between the machine learning prediction and the, uh, um, um, and the experiment. This is actually can all be traced or primarily traced back to the Muffington approximation. If, uh, if we actually uh, uh, compute um, all of the spectra that we did using, um, uh, using the Muffington approximation rather than the model, we actually get very good agreement here. And as soon as we go beyond the, the spherical Muffington approximation, then the intensity of this peak drops quite significantly. Um, the, uh, on the right hand side here, again, the, the red line is the uh, uh, experiment. The black line is the, the machine learning predictor. This is again from a thousand snapshots of the, uh, the tetrachloride species. So with the cobalt with four chlorines attached. Um, Again, there are deviations which, um, um, in this case, um, uh, the deviations are larger. It's not as good, um, and a, a good deal of these can be um, can be traced back to kind of the the what we're inputting. So the the limitations of the Muffington approximation. Um, on the uh, on the bottom here, actually, it shows the the essentially the convergence of our of our spectrum. Uh, at, with the number of, of spectra that we actually put in. So on the bottom here, while it says the number of predicted spectra, what this actually means is the number of, um, of snapshots from MD that we use to generate our average spectrum. And just as, a, as an idea, the red line here, this red dash line, um, is um, a, a, an order of magnitude larger uh, or an order of magnitude better than the mean squared error we'd need to uh, have a mean squared error that was essentially the same size as the experimental difference that they're seeing. So we're, this, this red line is saying that we're essentially now an order of magnitude better than that so we can start to make, uh, compare our simulations to um, the, the experimental spectrum. And essentially what this is saying is that um, within about a hundred predicted spectra, then uh, then we we are we are converged. So a hundred different um, molecular dynamic snapshots. And so this is this is um, uh, the result. So these are uh, transient spectra. Um, so on the left hand side we have um, so the black line is the the experiment, uh, and the red line is the machine learning predicted difference. Um, for the, um, uh, you have the uh, cobalt uh, tetrachloride uh, with the cobalt hexaaqua. So experimentally, what they did was they actually took the two compounds themselves, generated them, and took their spectra statically. So this isn't actually a time-resolved spectrum. Um, it's just a different spectra. And the red line is our predicted spectra, and the, the, it matches the, the main feature. Okay, maybe not so much the pre-edge. Uh, but it matches the uh, uh, the the um, the trend pretty well, um, which is relatively um, um, nice. I was quite pleased with this. On the right hand side, this is what, well certainly what I considered the more interesting. So, um, and I will admit before someone points it out, we are slightly blessed with the fact the experiment has large error bars. <laughs> um, um, yes, uh, it, you know theoreticians sometimes like large error bars, but um, the, this is um, uh, the the dots with the the uncertainty is the the experiment where they've they've pumped the hexa aqua species um, to um, um, uh, to uh, uh, with the near IR laser so they've heated the sample up and uh, and this is the the transit or the different spectrum they've got and uh, and so if I just go back a couple of slides. Um, what they, they actually proposed in the paper. So this dashed line is, is a you know, kind of a cartoon of the schematic at 300 Kelvin. And this solid black line is a cartoon once you've added this, this temperature jump. And so the prediction was that you, the transient spectrum was um, still a slightly hotter version of this aqua complex, 
um, with um, a couple of these um, mono and di substituted chlorine species as well. Um, we, we actually, we, when we, we tried this, uh, we, we simulated all of the intermediates. Um, uh, any substitution with chlorine actually gives, um, uh, gave a rather poor agreement. And this red line, which is the machine learning prediction, uh, comes from simply just heating the sample up by 10 Kelvin, uh, which is actually consistent with the laser power and the temperature change they were, they were predicting. So in this case, um, uh, we, we're suggesting that they haven't got any new samples. It's just 10 Kelvin, slightly hotter sample. And in terms of structure, this actually has very little difference on the, the cobalt oxygen bond length um, um, in fact, it's just, it's just a little bit of um, um, the distribution of bond lengths increases slightly. Um, and, okay, it depends on, on, on how you look at it, but we have, there's a, looks like there's a negative feature here, which, feature here, which is in the pre-edge, which we simulate, which, but slightly um, offset in energy. Uh, we predict a positive feature here, which doesn't appear in the experiment. There's this negative uh, um, uh, feature here, uh, which we capture quite nicely. Seems to be a positive feature here, which we capture. Um, although, you know, as I said, we are slightly blessed with the fact that the uncertainty is, is large. Um, but our assignment, um, when, we, when we did this with any other temperature changes, we got, uh, we got um, uh, certainly the amplitudes were much greater than the experiment. Um, and, um, and the spectrum did not look anything like um, the experiment did. So just as way of conclusions, um, just to summarize, uh, we've implemented this neural network of which we, we hope our aim is to be able to simulate uh, um, any particular absorption at, um, um, uh, edge. I think the one thing that um, I'm not sure if I said at the beginning, um, but our really our objective is this is to supplement and support and not replace high level calculations. Ultimately, this is a model. Um, uh, as I said at the beginning, you know, we can call it fancy fitting. Um, there will always be some uncertainty in it. And so we, um, but what, I, especially for more complicated system, what I, what I hope we'll be able to get to the accuracy is that if you have a, um, a number of possible outcomes, this model could certainly reduce that down to a, a, a number that you could manage with higher level calculations. It appears that the, the network can be trained quickly. Um, so actually, the, 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 I think the biggest bar at the moment is the development of the, the, the training set. Um, um, but once you have this training set, the network with you know, 10,000 spectra can be trained within 20 minutes. Um, and as I've said in answer to a couple of questions, um, at the moment, this really is the initial framework. Um, and if we, if we want to achieve the objectives as said, then there really a lot of work needs, needs to be done. I think one of the things with doing the cobalt system is it really highlighted to us, you know, going beyond the muffin tin approximation. Um, this is something that we, we, we really need to be able to do. Um, the edge shifts, um, uh, certainly with um, being able to incorporate them, certainly getting down to subtle um, edge shifts um, uh, and be, um, having those described in the model is gonna be important if, if it's gonna um, um, uh, be a useful kind of tool uh, for experimentalists. And uh, obviously we want to expand across other elements in the periodic table. Um, so I've shown you iron, I've, I've shown you cobalt. Um, we, we've done initial work on copper and zinc it, it looks like the network performs similarly well on all of them, or similarly well or similarly badly, depending on your perspective. Um, and so I, I really think that these two first points are the things that we, we really need to kind of focus on going forward. Um, so just leave it to acknowledge. Um, so Connor is a postdoc in the group. He's actually, I did see him arrive on the talk um, and uh, he's done a lot of the implementation of this. Uh, Marwar is a PhD student um, uh, who's, who's uh, done a lot of work on the COBOL and the kind of structural representation. Um, I'm so disorganized that this group photo is terribly old and so neither of them are in that group photo. Um, so I apologize to both of them. And uh, 
uh, collaborators, uh, um, uh, Tetsuo at, uh, at Sackler, uh, Chris Milne at the Swiss Free Electron Laser, Wojciech at the uh, uh, European XFEL and uh, and Majed at Lausanne and these people for giving me money and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Very, very interesting talk. Um, uh, Matt Neuville, you had a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. I, I actually, I, I'm, I'm fairly confused by much of this, but I guess I'll start with um, why is the muffin tin approximation worse for cobalt than for iron? Um, I'll, so actually, if I, if I gave, um, so um, I don't actually um, think it necessarily is. Um, if I gave that impression, that was incorrect. I think wh wh what I meant um, is that uh, we actually, actually, that was my it became painfully was obvious to us with cobalt, and and I suspect part of it in in the in the case of um, in the case of the cobalt system. Uh, so the, the the muffin tin approximation always um, um, uh, starts to uh, suffer a little bit. It, um, um, with lower coordination because that interstitial region that you approximate is is larger um, and so the tetrahedral cobalt is um, um, is, is the worst example we have of, of uh, um, uh, the model and the the experiment um, so no I don't think that the muffin tin approximation is worse for cobalt than iron um, it's just that it 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 was it Okay, it, w it was obvious to us in this case. So, so if I can continue w with your cobalt spectra in particular, it looked mm -hmm. to me like um, from 15,000 uh, structures, 15,000 calculated spectra, that you would be able to do much better than that by inspection, uh, just by eye, or even taking data on a handful of spectra, uh, a handful of structures, you'd be able to do a better job of matching than in either of those and so I wonder what you show agreement and matching for spectra but do you have much information on matching of the structures that give rise to those spectra I didn't see that really come out do you have um, structures and you know say uncertainties in the structures from those spectra oh okay um so yeah, um, uh, so in terms of um, 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 uh, in, in terms of the well, so yeah, we um, for 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 the the transit here, we can extract the st the structure and and and, and the distribution um, so um, from from the molecular dynamics that we put into the structure. So the um, um, I must admit, I, I analysed this last week before I wrote the talk. So I, um, the the structure, the cobalt oxygen bond distance uh, was uh, two point. Uh, the average bond distance was about two point nine um, uh, angstrom plus or minus um, uh, 0 0.05. And actually, if if that as a standard deviation. And when we heated it up by 10 Kelvin, that standard deviation went up by um, to about uh, 0.07 angstroms. But the actual average bond length didn't change. Um, so yeah, I, um, you 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 um, you're right. I, I, um, so the 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 structures. Uh, so here, um, in the case of the the machine learning um, uh, model. Um, uh, the structures that we put in um, um, are all from the molecular dynamics. Uh, so they're all at DFT, um, PBE zero level. Um, uh, and yeah, there, there, may well, there may well be some um, error in the structure slightly. Um, um, but in this for, certainly for these cases, it seemed the larger error was the, if you, if you took the structure you had and you did, you went beyond the muffin tin, then you got a much better agreement. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, Matthew Marcus, you had a question about the, um, uh, the RDC. Do you have a minute to ask that? Yes, I do. Yes, yeah, that uh, you may be missing something, but in the RDC method, 
it seems that the uh, terms that actually have to do uh, pertain directly to the central atom, say the iron atom, are a minority in a big cluster. And so that would mean that if you have, say, a big cluster and you make an elemental substitution way out at the, you know, way far from the iron, it'll have just as big an effect as if you make it close to the iron. So I wonder uh, you know, how that uh, sort of, you know, how you end up privileging uh, the, uh, the iron atom. Um, so you're, you're right, the, you, we, um, we're not privileging the, the, the iron atom in this case. Uh, in terms of, um, well, the, the function is actually weighted by, 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 the, by the distance um, uh, from, uh, from the, from, from the, um, from the iron at, um, no, because that's then. No, it's all new. That's all. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's some over all of the, uh, um, of the atoms. But um, it is true that there will be some range of R's that will yeah. pertain to the iron atom, like uh, the iron oxygen distances. You know, so, uh, so big R will, you know, so in the range where a big R is near an iron oxygen distance, then the iron will have a big effect. Yeah. But only in that range. Yeah, that's right. Um, I must. I'm. Um, um, uh, this. I, I don't know if Connor is still on the line. Um, uh, if he wanted to come. Um, yeah. I'm. Um, you're right. I'm not. Um, um, he's obviously not. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I'll. Um, All right. We'll leave that as something yeah. to uh, for you two to follow yeah, up on on email. Good. We have a general question from Yang Ha um, about uh, uh, using theory as opposed to experiment for training. Uh, Yang Ha, do you want to uh, briefly state a piece of your question? Well, yeah. So right now we found a lots of studies in machine learning or on um, uh, simulated data like you did. So I just wonder if there exists a set of like nice clean experimental data so everyone in the field can use and to test their models or algorithms um yes yeah, so I, I i'm certainly not I, i'm well so of, of the volume that we need uh, i said realistically we 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 need we need about five thousand spectra you know as a minima as a minimum really um and um, I'm certainly not aware of anywhere that has that kind of volume of, of spectrum measured. Um, and I think most importantly measured under the same conditions, um, measured in, um, uh, with the same resolution. So um, if anyone knows, I mean, I'd, you know, I'd be more than happy to, to try it with the experiment. Um, but um, yeah, the, 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 other, the other kind of reason, um, well, so, when we first started looking through experimental data, then um, because there's not that, then there's a lot of different resolution. Um, but also, even if you were able to 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 get to get that, uh, you know, how do you do you do, you do this um, um, uh, using you know kind of standard transmission mode, or uh, um, or do you do her spectra? Or um, so that's why we've the, the lack of of consistency in 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 the literature. Um, and uh, and then that variability of, of, of the resolution um, um, is what why we focused on theoretical um, uh, data and yeah we we we, we 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 both with the with the with the iron where we tried it an iron trist bipedian and, and and myoglobin and then with the cobalt where it's been tried on this this temperature jump experiment um, it it looks like relatively promising but it's um it's still a quite a way to go but um um it, I, yeah the, i just don't think there's the experimental data to, to train the network yeah 